for the last six years I've been on a TV show where you turn up, you they mic you up and then you chat shit. There's loads of things that people assume so much and especially when press comes out and it's like this is this and Mars is that. It's like, no, you have no idea. Some nights my parents didn't eat because they had to feed us. And that like fucking broke me. Like I was like in tears when my dad told me this. I was like, what? Okay, Miles, you are guest number one on season four. Yeah, no, that's yes. a privilege, you know. That is a privilege. I also want to say thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm always like super grateful for every single guest because I think you guys take your chance with me. You're like, mm, yeah, well, come on. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> okay, no, like zen, relax. No, I'm You're cool. going to be fine. I'm cool, I'm cool. I'm ready. There's so many things I want to ask you. Yeah. And I feel like maybe the world wants to ask you. Let's start here. Yeah. I feel that people maybe have a misconception of you. You are right. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> What's one of like the biggest misconceptions? Uh, I would probably say, oh, I hate this word, but they like to call me a fuckboy. Mm. Mm. Okay, how warranted is that? It's warranted because on TV, that's the image and the character I have kind of given mm -hmm. to the public and to people. Um, but I guess people who actually know me and who are my close friends, they can see a whole different side of me and they know who I really am. So it used to really annoy me, but now it's like, that's fine. I don't really know you. You don't. It doesn't affect me what you think of me because of what you've seen on TV. I like that. We're going to get into that. I'm going to come back to that because that's actually, mm. I want to unpick that a little bit. Um, what's the side of you that we don't see? So you're people that are closest to you, that yeah. know you. What's the bits that we don't see? <sighs> like, <laughs> I, would, I think I'm just a bit of, a, I guess like, a bit like a goofball bit of just like an idiot at times and just really I think sometimes I try to be as serious as I can be with work and tv and and then I try to have a lighter side but I don't necessarily share it with everyone um so there's a there's a much more vulnerable side and emotional side that I have that only honestly a handful of people will see why do you think that is? Um, for me, the last how many years, it's been understanding that I've had to play up to a certain role, I guess. That sounds really weird to say, but like cool. a role. I see my life as a movie. Uh, I've always have. And it's just understanding that, yeah, that is the character I've been playing. Who is me? There's a, there's a certain, you know, real element of me in there but it's overplayed and i think it's got me to where i am today because of that and i guess it's kind of maybe lost in translation when i've maybe not i've just put that at the forefront more than mm -hmm. the person that i want to show off more but i'm i don't i wouldn't say i'm scared of showing that person but i i'm definitely more aware that i, I don't want to give that person to everyone because it's very sacred to myself. Okay, interesting. Mm. Let's take it back to when you said you've always viewed your life like a movie. Mm. I mean, I feel like there's going to be pros and cons to that. I love it because yeah. to some extent, I think I do. My friends yeah. say it to me. Yeah. They're always like, only you. Only things would happen to you in that way. And I'm like, yeah, I manifested it 100% yeah. like through and through. Has it always been that way? Like, have you always viewed it as a movie? Yeah, since I was a kid. So, because like when I was a kid, I I come from a really creative family. So, you know, my dad's a musician and my mother's a, an artist. Um, when I was nine or ten, probably younger actually, my dad got me one of those camcorders, and I would film everything, like everything and anything. And I taught myself how to edit. I taught myself how to film and understand, like how to create a scene or things like that and I really loved it I really just enjoyed because what I would see in my head I would want to recreate and I think growing up like that everything that would happen in my real life 
I would kind of imagine it in my head as a movie. So I'd have scenes in my head, r- r- whether it's like a, a girlfriend, whether it's a friendship, whether it's like, and it's 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 really weird because sometimes I catch myself and I'm like, you got to take yourself out of it because mm. I'll have like, a moment, this is uh, so bad, but I'll have a moment with like my best friend and we like hug and in my head. I'm like, I can hear the music in the background <laughs> and <we're>, it's like <laughs> friendship. <laughs> and then I like play things like that in my head a lot. Okay, I love that you shared that. And there's, I feel like there's the other side of it that I really want to explore in a second with you. But I get that. And yeah. As much as you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm sharing that. I also feel like it shows like a massively creative side of you, mm. which when you explain what mum and dad do in yeah. my head, I'm like, oh, is it fair to say you've grown up in a really creative family? Yeah, 100%. Hence the reason maybe why like you are super creative and you, yeah, I feel like you do what you do, but like you do a lot of different things. Yeah, I think uh, my dad gets annoyed at me nowadays because he oh. wants me to be more creative like I was when I was younger. Okay. Um, but as you can know that the creative industry is hard to pay the bills of that. Mm. It is very hard. Yeah. Uh, so when I got into TV and I was no longer behind the camera and I was in front of the camera, it allowed me to create a life that would live and enjoy life and do things that I, you know, I know a lot of my friends would never ever dream of doing mm. and be in positions that I would never have thought I would be meeting people. Uh, and, you know, I've lost the creativity because of that, but then I've gained the experience in life. Like, wow. Like being in the TV industry has, I have seen some things <laughs> and I have witnessed things and I've, been a part of things and and moments of like this is this does not happen for mm. normal people i guess normal people and i hate to say like normal people it just if you're not in a creative industry you may not understand if you're just in normal nine to five um so yeah my dad always goes you know it's i want you to be behind the camera again and film and he always when i do like an edit he goes i know that was you who edited it and i'm like how is because like, i know you've got that, that touch you know exactly what it looks like and how to frame someone all this i guess yeah i do and I, i'm a bit of a perfectionist like even when it comes to my own podcast like mm. our host charlie when we do little reels and tiktok videos from the main podcast like there's a specific way i need it to look and a way to it needs to be cut and i almost don't want him to do it but then at the same time i'm doing all work so i'm like no do it <laughs> but then i'm like be careful because it needs to look like this and all that so i think that's really important there's so many things there like i'm like yes yeah, smiles yes yeah. <laughs> like this makes so much sense yeah. also it makes so much sense why you do what you do now but even that in terms of like the perfectionism trait i know so many people it's such a thing mm. and it's come up with my clients this week as well and it's the the need for it to be perfect i also think that to some degree it's your strength because it makes you great at what you do it's mm. going to give you that edit that's going to be like second to none but it's also about knowing when it tips over into a realm of like right this is hindering me this isn't helping me perfect example you're like wait i'm doing all the work okay let me give it and it's a sense of control as well oh 100 because you're like yeah and you don't trust anybody else to do it to your standards hell yeah and maybe (laughs) your dad's right in terms of like your editing is amazing and that is your like your skill set your forte right yeah so you can stay in that zone that's great but i think it's just super important as well to just flag that the perfectionist comes up for a lot of people. I always say like for a lot of high achievers, that's my yeah. beautiful audience that listen. Yeah. Like super busy, professional, high achievers. Mm. Like that is who I guess I talk to most of the time. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important as well to share because I think sometimes people don't, you feel like you're the only person that's going through it. Like it's in your head. And until yeah. you voice something, I feel like you've definitely been on the vulnerable train lately. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to see how vulnerable we go today. I <laughs> um, need a box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> we can provide, don't worry. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that's really important to hear. And that you're, how much do you feel like you release the control now? Where you notice it creeping in? Way more, I I, I feel that I, I kind of now give more i've realized nowadays especially with building businesses that just because you have the visual idea and you know what it wants to be and how it should look and all these things learn to trust the fact that someone can do that job better than you Mm. and i think that is great because it's allowed me to think okay well 
I know that this is my fault. I'm very good at this, but I'm not scared of saying, okay, I'm going to talk to this guy or talk to this person who's going to know how to film this or record this or a business, business consultant who's going to understand the the strategy of how it should go, even though I'm thinking, wait, actually, I want it this way. And But I'm like, no, I need to trust them because they have done it before and they know their shit. So for me, that's been really, probably in the last year and a bit, I've understood that more. Nice. And that's important because before it was like, no, 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 this is how I want it to be. And I've allowed it. It's been hard. <laughs> it's hard to not have that control anymore but yeah it's i'm learning still i think as well there's this balance right between if you have the vision and mm. you're leading there is a very different role between you leading and you doing yeah and it sounds like with your businesses and that creative side of it like you can have the vision but it's how you communicate it and lead it yeah of course and there's something I talk about if my clients listen to this. Sometimes they listen to a podcast episode and they quote things back to me. I'm like, oh, did I say that? <laughs> um, but I always talk about your zone of genius, which I didn't make up. It's from Gay Hendrix, but it's what you're talking about. Yeah. So everything else that is not your your like real specialist skill, and this doesn't mean that has to be editing, for example, but it sounds like something for you is around like the creative field, yeah. right? That can transform and it will evolve and it will come out in loads of different ways. Mm. But you want to spend like 90% of your time in your zone of genius. Yeah. Everything else you want to ditch, right? Yeah. So underneath that, you've got your zone of excellence, your zone of competency, and then your zone of incompetency, Yeah. right? So for me, my zone of like excellence is organization. Mm. And when I'm in my danger zone, I spend too much time doing it because I can, it's effortless. I'll do it for me and a million other people. Yeah. I don't need to. So it just sounds really sim similar in terms of when you're thinking about like delegating and releasing the control. 100%. It's like, yeah, you could do it. Okay, I could do my finances. Yeah. Well, will an accountant do them better than me? Mm, hell yeah. Yeah. Do I need to spend like maybe a week doing them when they're probably going to do them in two hours? Yeah. No. So I think it's, um, it is a hard journey mm. for sure because you want it perfect and yeah. like each narrative feeds into the other but i think if you can master it especially in business then yeah in anything actually it doesn't matter whether it's your business somebody else's business your career you're going to be like a way happier human yeah doing it yeah 100 percent. completely agree how much you know when you're talking about okay you were really creative mm. before this side of like what your life looks like now yeah how much of like do you get in your day-to-day -day life where you feed your creativity? Um, zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'm here for the honesty. <laughs> no, so weirdly enough, the last, the last two months, actually, you know what? No, I would say the last five to six months, I have actually tapped into that creativity way more. And that's because of building my podcast because but on a podcast as you know it's very creative in, in the sense especially when we were filming it in our in my flat and then we had our we were filming with my iphone and we, were, <laughs> we bought some equipment and it was just all over the place but it, i really enjoyed it because i went back to post-production and for the first six episodes i edited all of them and that is a lot of work that is a lot a lot of work i don't do mine and i'm not gonna ever do it yeah it's it's a <laughs> lot of work but i did it because it was really important for me doing this and now setting up a new business with the podcast um, is I want to understand every aspect of uh, how to create a podcast and how to, mm. to make it perfect. And, and that goes back to what we were saying, understanding that there needs to be other people to come in to, to make it perfect, but allow them to learn about it as well. So yeah, not the fact that I'm, oh, you, you're going to teach me, then I'm going to do it. It's like, no, 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 I want you to do the job, but I want to know that I understand the whole concept of how it works and all that so i would definitely say since then my like creativity has been way higher like which is great really really enjoyed it and i've enjoyed the struggles of it as well kind of finding understanding mm -hmm. how to find that solution and i haven't done it for a while because for the last six years i've been on a tv show where you turn up you they mic you up and then you chat shit <laughs> and it is probably taking every single ounce of my creativity because i love what i do i'm not gonna mm. i'm not bashing the tv industry and i've had amazing experiences and i still am having amazing experiences with with the show but you know talking about drama and who hooked up with who and who said this about you and all that is i've just got no time from it like for me, that's, mm. it's just wasting my energy. I was going to say it's a very draining 
exercise like tv show or not right mm. if we just take the concept of drama and talking about other people yeah and we talk about us as like energetic humans there's only so much energy every single one of us has yeah, and what you do with it and <laughs> this is about this is not about to undermine what you do by the way i just realized <laughs> the tone of how this is coming out and i was like wait i need to retry <laughs> but my point was that yes whether you're on a show or not talking about other people and the energy that you put into it mm. is a lot and yeah. it's draining yeah. and I talk a lot about manifesting. So it's really about as well, like what vibration of your frequency that you're giving out. It's not about being happy all the time or positive, but it's what you engage in and the Mm. people you surround yourself with and the types of conversations that you have. Before we get into the show, a question I wanted to ask you when we're talking about like you essentially losing your creativity until like really recently. Yeah. What's the like trade-off for that? Because let me give you context, right? I talk about being authentic like Mm. to my absolute core right but it took me a whole entire lifetime to get there i was good at masking i grew up with like two religions two cultures i adapted i worked in the corporate world like i was everything but me for a really long time and i got to a point where i was like oh all right cool something has to shift but it got really bad before i really noticed how do you like lose your creativity still love what you do in your day-to-day And still, like, feel authentic in who you are? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I told you we're going to get deep. Yeah. Uh, The little things for me. Okay. Um, I've learned to love the small things in life. Like Tesco says, every little (laughs) little helps. (laughs) Um, But... uh, What's no, your little things? What are the it's things that honestly like, like my mornings. My mornings when I wake up, I put a podcast on, um, usually Joe Rogan. <laughs> um, and then... You can stop it out for my episode next <laughs> <time>. <laughs> I will, Don't I will, I will. will. <laughs> um, and then I'll have my coffee and then I'll go for a walk. And if it's not the walk in the morning, it's my walk to the gym, which is like 22 minutes. Exactly. And that walk is so important to me like so important to me it's the the time where i can reflect on things and just be in my own presence because most days i'm doing something or doing something for someone or filming or doing something like it's always Mm. jam-packed with a lot of things um and you kind of you are you forget i forget how much the day goes like it's so crazy like especially when we're in the heart of like filming chelsea it's manic days and then on top of that i'm doing my own stuff and then filming other things and and all that so for me it's those little things that bring me back to to me and also massively um talking to my family most days like you know my sister and my dad and that's a loud fucking thing. Wow. <laughs> Did not, that's the first time we've experienced that. I was like, can we ignore wow. the yeah. siren? Sirens. No. Don't we've got an audio engineer. He'll take it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, no. So it's those little things. And uh, talking to, I FaceTime my parents like every day because they live in France. So okay. I, I'm, I, I try to be as close as I can to them. And that grounds me. That kind of although I'm no longer the creative Mars I was when I was younger, but I mm. get to talk to my dad and talk about his projects he's doing. And then that walk to the gym and having that coffee. And it sounds really stupid, but when you live in a lifestyle where you've experienced so much in words of like, wow, you, things that I've seen and places I've been to and mm. places I've stayed in and and people I've been around. And you're just like, it gets to a point where it's like, okay it's another day on the job really and it gets a little bit boring and you know you don't it's like for example someone going to dinner every night going to a restaurant every night you lose the the fun of actually going to a restaurant like i remember back in the day when i went to a restaurant first of all if i had the money to go to a fucking restaurant (laughs) it would be like oh my god you know it's been maybe a few weeks whatever we're going to a really nice place Mm. spending maybe 50 60 80 quid each on like a really nice meal loads of drinks whatever and that was so lovely but that's taken that's that's gone now It's, it's all gone because i do that all the time and i can do it all the time yeah um so for me those little moments oh i love it 
just it's me and myself and I like honestly yeah but that is, it illustrates like such an important point also you're not allowed to say it sounds so stupid by the way mm. you're on my podcast you're just like it's banned okay okay cool, like, cool you can't cool. diminish what you say you're allowed to say whatever you want to say yeah okay and be your true self okay um the reason why I think is so important as well and nice to hear it I guess from you mm. especially if like people see what the snippets of your life and the outside yeah. part of it but knowing that that's what grounds you and I talk about this a lot right at the end of the day it doesn't matter what all of our different lifestyles are maybe I should take that out I'm gonna caveat that in a minute right as in we all have different lifestyles yeah of course however we are also all human mm. and the grounding being able to ground ourselves is on one set us up for our day but also to the way you interact with each other and regulate your emotions I know I completely bitched about my morning this morning and it's been so long since I've allowed myself to like get into that space and then I got mad at myself <laughs> that I got into that zone and I was like Amira you know better like come <laughs> on but it's, the impo- it's also I share that as well because one it doesn't happen that often but two I am also human and I think sometimes when I talk to my clients, mm. think that it doesn't happen to me or that like I never have the cool. switch. But you've got to embrace it. That's something that I've, I've told myself. Embrace your emotions. Never like fight them. It's happening. You feel angry, feel angry. Like it's important to feel those emotions. The more you fight it, the more you hold things into your body and you'll you'll see like a lot of people always think when they have like, oh, they get loads of spots or they get, they're really bloated or things happen to their body. They always think, okay, I need to go to a doctor or I need to maybe eat less of this or I'm allergic to this or whatever. It's like, no, r- realize that your body, um, this sounds so cheesy, your body is a temple and your mind is so, it's so vulnerable. Like you need to protect it. So when you're feeling stress and when you're feeling these emotions, when you're fighting it, your body reacts to it really quickly. Um, and I think that's why I always, especially recently, I've been quite emotional. I I've told myself I'm just feeling this emotion right now. I'm just mm. like I'm letting it pass because it will go. As mm. much as it maybe feels painful or, or or if I'm angry or whatever, just let it go through the body, let it go through the mind and everything, and then and then you'll feel better. And gradually, whatever you're going through, day by day, you'll you'll feel better. You're dropping wisdom today. I'm not gonna lie. I, I didn't have you know any expectations. I thought we'll just see. We'll just see where you're at, right? But <laughs> I'm so here for it because one, in terms of like your mind body connection. Mm. Yes, I'm a massive advocate of like your body is just giving you signs and signals of like actually how you feel on the inside or what's yeah. going on for you, and maybe like what you're ignoring and you need to take note of. Yeah. And for me, I know that whenever I'm stressed, it shows up in my stomach. Like yeah. it's the one place that I know, okay, cool. You ignored, you pushed through, you're probably skating thin on on thin ice for burnout. Yeah. So like, all right, check yourself. Yeah. And you're right that the automatic, like if we think from a society point of view, it's like, oh my God, I need medicine. Or, oh my God, mm. I need the doctors. I'm also going to caveat that and say, it's not a bad thing. And there is <clears throat> a space for like medicine. And I'm oh, no, no, of course. It. No, I agree. But 100%. it's just those signs of saying, okay, cool. Actually, what's going on for yeah. me? And even listening to you, we're going to talk about the whole vulnerability in a second. But even listening to you say, all right, I know this is going to pass. This is what I'm feeling. This is not who I am. Like, that's such an important skill set that, like, we don't get taught that. No. Nobody says, all right, cool, you're not your emotions. And one thing I really wanted to ask you, because this triggered the thought, what, how did you guys grow up as a family? Because being able to do that now and like mm. regulate those emotions and say, okay, cool, like these are, this is not who I am. I'm yeah. not mad, I'm not angry, it's how I'm feeling. Yeah. Okay, what else is going on for me? And I know I'm going to get through it and it's going to pass. I mean, beautiful skill set. So, Love that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what was it like growing up in like your family unit and like how much did you guys express emotions and talk about things? Uh, massively, like uh, my parents, I mean, I had such a wonderful childhood. You know, I have two amazing parents who are still together to this day, nearly over 30 years of marriage. Um, Huge inspirations of how to take care of their children and one day how I would love to take care of my children like my parents did. But I was around struggle. I was around a lot of struggle, which people don't realize. I was brought up in a council estate. We didn't come from money. Um, We kind of barely knew our grandparents because of issues of families problems and uh things that have affected me now because of things that my parents have told me but they never they never showed it when I was a kid like I never knew I thought I was happy like I got fed I went to bed 
I didn't realize that we were in a tiny house and my parents lived in the living room. Like I didn't, the mm. things like I, I was, until, until I was in the French school and I went to my friend's houses, I was like, ah, <laughs> something's different. <laughs> my friend's got an elevator to go into his room. Okay, <laughs> things are not as they seem. And I think because I'm well-spoken and all this, like my, everyone thinks, okay, Mars has come from this crazy rich background. Like I say, yeah, my family live in South France. Like, oh my God, he, it's like, no, it was Brexit and my dad didn't want to live here anymore. And he went to South France and like his mother lived there and had a house there. So there's loads of things that people assume so much. And especially when press comes out and it's like, this is this and Mars is that. And it's like, no, you have no idea what, I've gone through and I'm not I'm, I'm also not here to say I've gone through some terrible trauma like I haven't I had an amazing childhood and my parents took care of me but there are some things that I found out only literally last year where my dad said to me we were talking about things and uh I wanted a at one point I wanted to film my dad as a documentary because my dad has lived through the crazy you know what if you wanted to interview someone my dad has gone through the craziest life I've ever known like i've just it's mad what he's gone through as a kid um to where he is today amazing and and we were talking about that and i one time i wanted to film him and do a documentary about him and all that and he was talking to me about how my mother was working for the house to make sure there was money in my dad was still studying doing his master's degree he had me and my sister and some nights my parents didn't eat because they had to feed us and that like fucking broke me. Like I was like in tears when my dad told me this. I was like, what? How does that even, he was like, yeah, because it was hard. We didn't, we didn't have enough money to feed all of us. And I'm like, and sometimes I complain about shit. Like, And I'm like, wow, like I go home. I've got mm. a, a very nice lifestyle. Of course I've got my stresses. Of course I've got my mm. moments where it doesn't go well in my career, whatever it is. But my God, like, going through that and that's what i'm so proud of my parents like they protected us and we had no idea well my sister knew apparently i didn't know <laughs> she told she was like yeah i knew that i was like no one told me <laughs> what's the age gap between you and your sister two and a half years and she's older yeah okay I even think though i treat her like my little sister but yeah this is a really similar the reason i asked right is the sibling dynamic i think is mm. it shifts and it grows right yeah. and it's so different when it's uh, a brother and a sister yeah because it's the same with me and my brother and he's younger and it's by two years yeah. and i was like when she turned around and said yeah i know and it's the difference in shift because she's the oldest mm. as well yeah of course and when i say she's female it doesn't yeah. mean that if you were the oldest son that you wouldn't have absorbed it but i think there's something different in terms of I'm just really going to back her here because I've probably had a really similar experience. Yeah. But it's different when you're the the oldest. And it's funny because it, me and my brother have a lot of like mutual friends. Yeah. And so to this day, people will just assume that he's older than me. Yeah. I'm like, guys, I grafted for us. <laughs> like, excuse me. Yeah. Um, but I think that's so important. One, just thank you for going there. Okay, because mm. I think you're right that most people, there's a part of your life that they don't know. And I'm not saying that they should or they have to, but yeah. it gives a whole different insight into like who you are. And yeah. actually the environment that you've grown up in. One thing I'm going to say before we even continue is please can we shout out your mom and dad? Yes, 100%. Because for the, amazing. Not just for the incredible marriage, right? Yeah. I'm all here for like romantic relationships. Mm. I'm like, yes. Um <laughs> But also for the fact that when they were struggling, mm. maybe we'll say not your sister, but you didn't know, right? Yeah. And I think there's something so incredibly powerful when you're in a family unit, mm. that level of protection and oblivion. Yeah. And for you, I love the like juxtaposition of, okay, they had their struggles and it was, it sounds like, mm. because I wasn't there, it was tough. Yeah. But you describe it as, oh my God, I loved my childhood. Yeah. Like I had such a happy, healthy. And to be able to like, for them to experience that and to be able to provide this on the other hand. Yeah. And I th think maybe you have a deep appreciation. of like. I mean, yeah, crazy. Like even like I think about Christmases, like my dad didn't want me to feel jealous because of my school pupils. So he would get me expensive things that he would finance. Like, an iPhone or a laptop. And I had, n again, this is one of the things I had no idea mm. he was spending this money because he didn't allow me, to, he didn't want me to know. Mm. Like my dad, 
went through a struggle. Obviously, as it got older, he set up a business and it did well, whatever. But through those years, I didn't think anything different of the fact that I went to school and if my mate had the new, back in the day, it wasn't iPhones, it was like Sony Ericsson or the Motorola, <laughs> and, you know, those phones, sorry, young young kids out there. But oh, no, You can't even say that because <laughs> I was like, yep, yeah, I'm sure I'm older than you. That, But for, for me, that was, uh, you know, that was like sick because I'd come to school and I'd have the same phone as my mate or whatever. Mm. And it was never, he never really wanted me to see that. I understood it as I got older yeah massively because um well you have eyes and you can see you can yeah. see the differences um but because he he never this is where my dad was smart he calls me this still to this day he calls me a fake rich and <laughs> uh, a fraud <laughs> because okay I'm waiting for the explanation and gone you, you know you fake it till you make it <laughs> um, which I've been doing very well uh, but yeah he uh, he kind of installed in me that no matter who you are presented with in front of you and who you talk to like there is a certain way to hold yourself there's a certain way to be and there's a certain way to make sure that person never knows anything about you and they can assume they can judge whatever but that means that when you do something with if it's a business related thing or anything and you give life advice to them whatever they will be shocked by okay maybe i thought something from you or whatever and I, we don't really know who this person is he's very slick my dad you never know what does he do like he wears all black all day that's all and there's no colors <laughs> even though we keep every christmas we buy him like a green jumper and it's like come on dad please just put some colors on um but yeah so and my mother always wanted us to be really well spoken so we sound posh but we're not posh. We're not. We're, my dad's Caribbean and my mom's from Kent and not the good part of Kent. <laughs> Isla Sheppey. Like, it is, uh, no offense, a shit hole there. I was like, okay, we have to come and be like, no offense, team. <laughs> no offense, but it is. It's, it's you know, you, and my mother, when she was born then, she, at 18, she ran away and she, you know, all her friends and her sisters still live there. And it's tough when I go see that side of the family. I'm like, whoa, okay, I've had a very lucky upbringing because of what my parents wanted me to see and wanted me to have and what they didn't have. Mm. Um, but anyway, that's a, that, that's a huge story. But <laughs> essentially, yeah, my parents, and I'm, and this is why he, I said, you know, he goes to me, you're a fake rich. I'm like, yeah, because you install this into me. I now go to parties or things. I've been to places where you would think I am an absolute baller. Nope. <laughs> At times, when I started Chelsea, yeah. I had no money in the account. And I would have to pretend to be around my peers who were filthy rich because their parents would give them money, a lot of money. And I'd have to act like that was normal to me and that I was having the same thing. And I was like, yeah, sweet, I can do this, I can do that. When I couldn't, but I did it so well that it then brought me to a stage where, oh, okay, cool. I did make money and I did my own thing and I, I, you know, I'm building my own businesses now and all that kind of stuff. So it's really taught me loads and i love it i love that me and my dad did this once like this in south ken is a an, an art exhibition and it's, it's not there anymore oh, what was it called christie's or something like this and all the art is like a million plus right <laughs> okay. it's like and we'd go in like me and dad would dress up really nicely pretend to buy a piece of art and at the last second cancel <laughs> Like literally, I don't know like, this is really, bad really right now. lovely, and because also my dad's black, right? So mm. you go to this place, only old white people looking at this art, and I've I've felt it my whole life. Everyone looks at my dad, and it's hundred percent pure racism. Is he going to steal something? Is he gonna... And I've felt it, and I've been stopped in the street because I was my dad, and they thought I was selling. I was a drug dealer. It's fucking weird. But my dad's never allowed me to accept that to be a victim of it, mm. which I really, really love. Shit happens to everyone. Mm. He goes, racism is racism. And there's racism in all sorts of aspects of life. And yeah, sometimes he got it probably more than I actually do know. But yeah. I, I, I witnessed a lot of it. Um, I mean, I witnessed one day, this was mad. My dad was a guitarist and he, at the time before he had his music school, he would go to clients' houses with his guitar case and teach music. And he had 50 clients, didn't have a car, walked everywhere. My dad used to do like 50 to 60,000 steps a day. It was mad. Um, and a police van stopped next to him. All military came out with guns and all that, yelling him in the middle of the street, 
being like, open the case, thinking he had like drugs and guns. Like, isn't that like that's it's mad, but well, I remember when he told me the story, he's like, oh, cool, move on. I've got to keep going mm. forward. I can't let this affect me. I can't be a victim of like, okay, cool, there's racism. We get it. Mm. And I was, when I got stopped with him, and they were like, you look like a drug dealer. And I was like, hey, again, again, a little, my mum lost her shit. And I was 18 at the time, so they were allowed to stop and search me without my parents. Okay. So that angered them. But it was like, again, that thing with my dad that he's taught me over the years. It's like, so what? As long as you haven't done anything bad and you're not mm. doing anything bad, cool, let them expect it. As also, when I tan, I go really mixed race. People people forget that I'm mixed race because I'm very white. But like when I go on holiday, and that's when I was, I was in South France and for a whole month. And obviously I was like literally really, really mixed race. Um, and then they stopped <laughs> me and... I also I had like new shades and I like look to be fair I looked at myself yeah. I looked suspicious <laughs> like you're looking too fresh boy um, but yeah uh, so yeah that 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 has um, my father and my mother of course in in di- in a different way but father has taught me so much about life living it breathing it and just keep moving on I think as well there's definitely something powerful though when a dad is teaching his son because. Mm. I generalize here I, and somebody like countered this the other day and I was like I'm not saying this all the time but generally speaking like a mum tends to be closer and has a unique bond with her son versus mm. like a dad and his daughter but there's also something really powerful in terms of like as a son you're learning from a male figure that yeah. is inspiring you and role models for you and when people don't have that I think it's it doesn't mean females don't do amazing like no, job as single moms yeah. but I think that it's a really important facet and I think when you talk about the racism and you being mixed as well. Obviously, I'm talking to somebody that's mixed. So mm. when you describe the stories, there's nothing in me that's shocked, right? Yeah. As in like, I could come out with similar stories, yeah, yeah. right? To share. And I always say, when you're listening, like, that's not what you're trying to do. I want to listen and not make this about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, hey, I love it. Um, is there a balance of like sharing, right? So it's not the shock factor. It's mm. that, yeah, I can so see it i can get it and i've been in situations really really similar yeah and um i know that like we can joke about it and you're like yeah i looked a little bit suspicious um but when that becomes as well someone's like day to day yeah then it's and i know that like i said this this morning that there was like a microaggression when i was like on the way into Mm. the studio and the woman was talking like to her friend, like in front of me. And I was like, you're joking me, right? And I was like, are you looking at the color of my skin? And I was like, no, you probably think I'm white. So it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. But it was just the fact. And sometimes I think as well, because I'm mixed, I hear both sides mm. because people will perceive you in the way that they want to perceive you. And I'm like, oh, you wouldn't say that to me if you didn't think I was like you. Oh my God. The amount of times I've been in situations where someone has not known I'm mixed race <laughs> and they've said something. And then my mate who's like there, who knows me goes, yeah, I wouldn't say that, bro. <laughs> and he's like, why? And I'm like, yeah, it does black. So whatever. But it's, that's another thing I want, I want to touch on. Like what you just said, like the day to day. I've experienced it on a very, very small level. And I've mm. I've more experienced it with my dad. Mm. So less so myself because I look white. Yeah. I sound white. Like I have to just back you up there. You do. I'm sorry. Of course. Of course I do. And I sometimes I feel that like that's even bad saying that because like. No, it's not bad. No, but in terms of, no, this is what I'm going to say. In terms of it sounding bad that we talk like that. Yeah. Because like one of my other friends is Jamaican. My like friends since we've been mm. 10. Okay. And she got told her whole life, you sound white. Yeah. So she's like saying, she's like, what? So as a black female, I can't, I can't speak yeah. well. And she's probably got, maybe not as posh as you. Yeah. <laughs> but just a really similar yeah. accent. But look how much we stereotype. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, like, of I know you take, I feel like you take criticism probably more than most people, right? <laughs> so you could take it and that's not how I meant it. But it's crazy that even that we're generalizing yeah. to say like, you sound posh and what only white people are posh. Mm. And I just heard it from her. And I remember the time she's like, I get so fed up. People telling me, oh my God, you're, you're so posh. I'd why? Because I'm black. Yeah. And it's complete like on the other side of it. Also, I'm really sorry because I did interrupt you. No, no, no. But I think <laughs> going, uh, going on that point, it's because we've grown up with that society kind of norm of what a white person is supposed to sound like or what someone else of a different race is supposed to sound out, right? And that's because of education really shitty education that we yeah. still have and hasn't changed in over 100 years and it's i don't get angry at people who don't understand it 
Like some people get really yeah. annoyed at, I say, I don't know, minor racism or whatever. Like I'm around Chelsea people a lot. So there's a lot of it. And I don't because I look at them, I go, you don't know any better. No one has taught you. Yes, you're at a certain age. Maybe you should learn mm. and you should educate yourself more. 100%. And funny enough, these people are very well traveled because they've traveled to all aspects of the world because of their wealth and their families bring them to Barbados or their, whatever it is, right? And you're just like, okay, cool. Uh, but I also understand like you you don't get it. You've you've been brought up in a certain way, and that's not your fault. And I'm, mm. is it your parents' fault? Maybe, but I think it's up to you now, growing up and being on your own. And if you do separate yourself from your from your family, and I think everyone should. You know, you shouldn't be completely you know, love your family, but you needed to have your own journey and your own experiences. Um, and if you do, that's when it's up to you to learn and understand that certain things cannot be said and mm. your attitude towards, towards certain things need to be different. Um, so yeah, day to day, I think someone who really feels it and goes through it, I can never really understand. Mm. Yes, through my father, because he tells me stories and I was there and I've witnessed things, but... It's different because it's, it's different. not your experience. It's not my experience. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm proud to be mixed race. Like a lot of people go, you're so not, you're so white. And I'm like, yeah, I am. But you know what? I'm also so black. Yeah. I am for me because my dad is Caribbean. I've got my whole family. My grandmother's Indian. All our uncles and brothers and sisters, they're all mixed. None Apart from my mum's side, my, I've, I know we didn't really... Not that we didn't grow up my mother's side of family, but we didn't see them as much as my dad's side. So I've seen colours all my life, <laughs> honestly, like crazy. And I love that. And that's another thing. I'm so grateful to be cultured. Like so grateful to have that. I love hearing like this side of you. One, I'm always, I'm so obsessed with like culture, I think. And it's for me, I had this conversation the other day, actually. And somebody said to me, uh, actually, I was talking to my friend. I'm going to say he's black because it's very relevant to the story. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Okay. Um, but, and I was talking about my experience as a mixed race female. And I was like, I've always been aware of race. And he was like, what? And he was mm. like, I haven't. And I was like, how is, as a black man in London, have you not been aware of race until like a certain point? Yeah. But it was until like his like adult, early adult years. And he was like, well, at what point did you become aware of it? And for me, there was like a real distinct in terms of like, I went to a really predominantly like white primary school, but I was oblivious. Mm. I, was, I was probably like token mixed race girl. I think yeah. there was one black boy in us in our class and then maybe a brown girl. Yeah. But like I was oblivious, which I think is actually beautiful at it that is. age, really right? Good. And then I, sh I went into senior school and then things really shifted and everything became about race. And... I love hearing when you say, oh, I'm proud though of my experience as a mixed race person. Mm. And one, I really relate when you're like, no, I've seen every color and like my side of the family. Like I get that because mm. it's really similar on my yeah. side. But what's also interesting as well is like as a mixed race person, when you get categorized into different boxes. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I always say like play it to your advantage, right? 100%. You get the best of oh both. My God, I you... always say yeah. that, right? But it's interesting then when you're saying like the environment you're in and when you're around like a lot of white people yeah, and actually how that shifts. And just mm. one other thing you coming back to, because I think it's important and I feel like people listening to this are going to have like their own views and their own yeah, opinions. And so I just want to encourage people like, this is why we're having the conversation. So like, have it. Don't bash us please for anything we've said, because I do feel like it's a really deep conversation yeah. as well when we pick, we're just taking like one segment of it. Yeah. Um, but even uh, you saying as well, like, is it their fault? And I, I agree. Like, it, I don't think it as well, it's about blame, right? But then it's when does the ownership kick in in terms of, okay, cool, I'm going to learn yeah, of course. a different way. And it's funny because I was having a different conversation. This is all very timely for this episode. It wasn't <laughs> on purpose, right? Um, with somebody the other day and they're white and they're gay and they were talking about their experience of coming out. And then we got into race and I was like, similar things they felt like coming out was like certain periods yeah. of my life as being mixed race, right? And they were like, what? Is that how you feel? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, oh my God, I've never thought about it like that. Anyway, and we got into it and then we used like Harren and Megan as an example. Yeah. And we had quite different views on it. Oh, interesting. What? <laughs> Quickly, not because <laughs> like, that, oh, what that is, do we want to get into let's it? not get go into on. that. No, let's re, I don't want to get into that because okay, I've had on. my views on it already on my social media. Okay. Uh, <laughs> What what is your view just on generally? What do you, is your view on Megan? 
So I'm going to say from the beginning yeah. that I know I'm biased. Okay. So I really want to come in from that angle. I loved her before she walked into yeah. the royal family. And I was a very big like supporter of her when she was an actress. Yeah. Like really there's a lot of like <laughs> that I'm going to affiliate with because she's a, f- a mixed race female which bear in mind when I was growing up there weren't really uh, Alicia Keys was my role model yeah. like other than her I probably couldn't pinpoint that many other yeah, people yeah. Um, I went to play piano because I loved Alicia Keys that much oh amazing like, that's what I yeah, went to yeah, yeah. like that's not what I did I mean I did it but, yeah. um, for a very long time but um, I did that was my role model so um, anyway big fan of Megan yeah. um, I don't think it's a black and white story at all I just think I don't like at all the way the UK press report. And I feel like you're probably going to have your own experience of this. I don't have an experience Mm. of it personally at all. I just feel that when we want to go in to any conversation that is just black and white, you remove all the nuance for it. It isn't about right and wrong. They're a family. They're also, her experience from the outside world is completely different to what he's experienced. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot on his side, you know, that's been huge for him to essentially say goodbye to his family and like be bold enough to go and do that, which I'm all for. And I'm very much for the underdog. And I'm very much about, you know, like let's fight for what we believe is right, which I really know is gonna trigger people. And like the conversation I had the other day with somebody was the complete opposite. And they were like, what a mirror? And they were like, so were you offended when she said the comment around when they asked what color her her kid would be? And I was like, yeah, I think it's rude. And they were like, but it kind of came back to an earlier point you said around, yeah. but they don't know. And there's curiosity. And the good thing out of this conversation for me was that it gave me a different perspective. Yeah. And I never want to come out of things being right or wrong. Yeah. I want to be curious and I always want my mind to be opened because yeah. I can only see it one, like through my experience. Course, yeah. So I am a fan of her. Yeah. I think that she has a voice and I'm all yeah. about my whole entire business is built on talking okay yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. um I am all about like having a voice I think there's things that people are upset with her about the way that she's done it but I also feel like the press slaughtered her there and, is nothing positive yeah and she you know what regardless of the way she did it and if people aren't happy with the way she did it she did it no one has done it and no one's gone against the royal family and no one has gone against the press. Like, I think, not to go into deep, but I completely agree with everything you just said. And for me, having, a, again, a very small taste of what press can do to you and how they can twist stories and how they can say things about you. Um, fuck me, that's, that's, that's something that on another level she experienced that no one in this country, no one will ever know and understand. So how dare you? be annoyed at her fighting for her own justice in this domain. And that's what I will say and keep it there. Because I've got a lot <laughs> of friends. You said it so beautifully. Go a, on. a lot of friends that I have on the show love the Royal Family, and, and um, which is fine. And like, hey, I'm not, I'm not really, I don't really have much to say about the Royals. Like, cool. Uh, the, why do we still have Royals? Cool. Um, <laughs> we, it's annoying, but... Uh, I feel like the comments under this episode are going to go yeah. off at this yeah. section, but we're here for it. I'm all about the openness. But it's also, Let's go. It, it's about, this is why I had someone slate me. <laughs> I had someone slate me for comments I had said something about veganism. <laughs> 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 Don't know if she's going to listen to this. If you are, whatever. Uh, and the one thing she couldn't grasp was like, you do know that the whole point of a podcast and a conversation is to create debate yes. and to understand that you may ask something that is wrong or right, whatever it, whatever, whatever it is, yeah. but to understand that someone else is going to open up their opinion about it. So also you're as an interviewer, like someone who's going to interview someone for a podcast or an interview or TV, whatever it is, you're prompting them in a way that you want to get them to be like, oh no, you want them to kind of see it in a different way or argue a little bit or debate it or have a more interesting conversation than just like, I completely agree and I'm mm. not gonna say anything that's gonna be harmful or whatever. Because she, at the time she was like, yeah, you ask stupid questions and all these things. And I was there like, no, I'm doing mm. my job. Mm. I'm talking to someone about something that I don't necessarily know a lot about, no. but I'm also creating conversation. So I know I can understand. And then also, it's a great little moment to, for people who's a viewer who have my opinion yeah. and who have their opinion. Yeah. That's the whole point of it. 
I think you like honestly spot on and even taking it back to, I'm going to bring it back to press in a second. Mm. And I really respect when you're like, you said it so eloquently. I was like, yep. And I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to say that I resonate with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not particularly like a fan of the Royals. I'm not against them. It's just yeah. very similar. Right. So, but I really, really agree in terms of like her experience and what you said and that there's nobody that knows the the extent of that and the absolute passion so i guess bringing that back to you actually the other thing i want to say yes we are all here for the open conversation (laughs) but it is around i think that we have to come out of the filter of like being right or wrong Mm. and remembering that okay stay curious you might learn something you don't have to come out of that conversation and agree like that's not the goal of it okay that was me preaching what i wanted to take it back to was um you have had i think your fair share and i only know like snippets (laughs) of this right okay yeah how do you navigate those moments let's say when the press is going to town or whether it's comments social media like just talking generally right i'm not talking about a specific situation yeah And the reason I really, really want to hear your perspective on it is because I'm going to say within my audience, right, as high achievers, it can be so difficult to take criticism. Mm. There's a difference between, you know, like it being some sort of healthy point. I think I saw you and Charlie like on the podcast say, guys, we took your feedback on board. Keep giving it to us. Like, yeah, we know the sound wasn't great. Like just, but you know, we've got new this and new that. And I was like, oh my God, I just, I loved like just hearing that, right? Yeah. Um, So there's a difference between that kind of feedback and it's helpful and you can do something with it versus like you getting slaughtered for who you are. Yeah, we, we, uh, (laughs) you know what's annoying about just briefly on the podcast thing we had a uh an episode i think it's episode three i don't know if you listened to this on it it's honestly just charlie and i laughing (laughs) we don't talk much because we got into like a a place of hysterics and we couldn't stop giggling and we filmed maybe an hour of it of just laughing and like we're we're honestly i remember this day i couldn't stop laughing and Charlie goes to me, we can't post this. I said, yes, we can. Mm. He's like, there's no, but it, we've said nothing. I went, yeah, but that's what's so good is because they get to see uh, us as just being idiots and just talking shit and not even talking and just laughing at each other. And the comments, what's annoying about that episode though, it that it got us a really bad rating on Spotify because everyone was like super looking forward to the release of their first podcast. And episode three, they just laugh at each other and they don't talk and then it got down luckily <laughs> i've built it up a little bit more now uh, but the standing apple reviews are those ones so those are the first ones so, and i'm like please guys can you now like come back and just look at all what you've done but um no to go back on the um the press and like dealing with all that kind of stuff um dealing with i guess is all like, i'm gonna just put it under the umbrella of like bashing or like yeah. severe kind of like it's not criticism, I don't think. I think that it gets to a point where it's, especially as well when it's coming from lots of different angles. And I it, guess like, how do you deal with it? You you um, you don't deal with it. You you have to be strong. Um, this 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 industry, man. Like I've said it to so many people. Like if you are mentally weak, please take a strong think about about going into it. It is really challenging. Luckily enough, in the beginning, I laughed at it a lot. I used to, Twitter was the worst. Um, because I was just having fun. I was young and I was like, yo, whatever. And I was like, I used to re- reply to the to the people <laughs> going, ha ha, laughing face. And they're like, you're this, you're that. And, and they also, they it, it, it really depends because you'll have press bashing, which are, they'll take stuff from your real life and they'll find out things. And then they'll try to say, you're this type of person, whatever. And then you have the other side of it, which is you're on a TV reality show and they're going to mm. judge you on a scene or what you're doing with a character, not a character, but a another person and they're going to judge you on a storyline rather than who you are as a person so you got both mixed in together and that can be really sometimes you go but i'm not fucking like that and also they've <laughs> edited me in a certain way and i'm not that, that can be frustrating but it's been harder mm. the l- last year was terrible for me really okay. difficult um i've been so good at it i was like god it doesn't hit me it's great keep saying all this shit last year was even the show, they had to take me aside. Like, how are you feeling? And I was like, I'm not gonna. Sh- I'm not filming. That's why there's loads of press articles at the moment saying saying that I'm quitting Chelsea. I haven't, but I've taken a bit of a step back. Um, but last year, I my role, and this goes back to what we were saying in the beginning. Like, was I've been playing up to this character, this 
player, fuck boy, whatever they want to call me. Um, and I did play up to that person. I was that person. I'm not even saying I wasn't. I was that person. Mm. But I, it wasn't something I wanted to do. Like it was, it made sense for Chelsea. And it was like the, the young Lothario, he's French. He thinks he can talk to any girl and all this. And I was like, shit, hell yeah, I can. <laughs> Let's do it. And I played with it so well that it landed another f- full yeah five years of me doing this you know person um and last year i went through a a situation on tv with uh, this girl and before that there was another girl and before that was another girl and it was in the space of like six months not even three months and oh i don't know how much i can say because i've got to be careful i didn't date them because i wanted to okay that's what i'm gonna say okay and on TV, it looks like I played around with someone's emotions and mm. dated someone and then went, oh, whatever, I don't like you. I did it because at the time that was TV mm. and I dated them because they were, you know, they were nice people, but I didn't want to be with them. Mm. Because, and I never, if, it, if a camera wasn't on me, I wouldn't have dated them. Mm. If you see what I mean. I so definitely see what you mean. <laughs> because of that, on screen, people who watch the show, they go you dated her and now what you're dating this girl mm. oh and you're playing with her emotions and now you're dating this girl and it's like yeah yeah and then it got so bad the hate people anything i would post they'd comment underneath you're a pig you're disgusting how you treat women and the biggest thing for me was how i treat women and i don't like that at all because i am so respectful to women i again my education with my mother and my sister and having a sister being around that yes i have been a dick in the past i'm not gonna say i haven't i want to say that i feel that at some point most guys have to go through the dick yeah, stage course. to move through it that's a generalization yeah. team please don't like take but that it, away it, but it, it there is. is that phase of like figuring it out sometimes as well for females i feel like it's the reverse of like you're going through the stage where you course. accept all the rubbish and like don't have the boundaries and 100%. like don't say hey like this is i'm worth more than this yeah. so i feel like on both sides there's 100%. like percent it's kind of like a pathway into like right cool i've done that bit now well to go on to that quick i was talking to actually laurie i think i said this yesterday i, was, I can't remember who i said it to um i something a quote came up and i found it so interesting and so true um fathers teach their sons mm. how to court a woman or how to be with a girl hopefully respectfully and my dad did and how you know to ask a girl out and all this and how to treat a girl mm. open the door for her do this pay for the first day do nah, 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 nah. being a relationship my dad taught me so much i, I loved it It was great he told me all his stories i was like oh no way and, I was, <laughs> and he was so excited for me when i first started dating but interestingly enough mothers have never taught women how to treat men they're expected to be treated. It's a, there, it's an expectation of like, men will treat you good and that's it. And you've got to have the man take care of you. This is right. I, For me, I'm traditional. I want to take care of the girl that I'm in love with and I want her to have the best life. And ideally, I want her to have her successes, but I want to take care of her. Mm. But at the same time, which I've recently been feeling, <laughs> <laughs> on a side note, is yeah, have women been taught how to treat men when they're down, when they don't feel good, when they're emotional, when they hold in all this pent up anger and they don't know how to express it and they don't know how to hug someone because they feel vulnerable and they feel like they don't want to showcase that love. And they, and you've seen it in movies and it's true. Women, I don't believe, and in my experience, haven't, haven't understood when, if a guy's really quiet at the moment, what does that mean? What is he going through? What does what do you need as a partner to do? Um, and I I've, I saw that quote and I was like, I've never thought about it in that way because this my whole life I've been taught or told don't do that with women mm. or be respectful in that way. Make sure you do this, and I am, mm. you know. So, but then, I feel like you do need to say that, which is good. Yeah, so I feel like it's going to counteract what other people think. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, a hundred percent, I am, and this is, and like you were saying, it's a two way thing, right? You've got to understand each other. I think that the biggest thing that our biggest problem, I think, in our day and age right now, is men and women want to be so different. Or sorry, men and women want to be seen as the same thing now, and it's like we have to accept that men and women are different and understand that we're different, but it's so beautiful that we're different. 
and we need to stop fighting it. The more we fight it, the more we're going to be separated and the more we're not going to have long lasting relationships. The more you understand that you as a female are different to me and I am as a man different to you, but we understand each other and we're, we cater to each other and we're there for each other, understanding our behaviors because we are different. We will be so much closer together. And that is a powerful, beautiful thing. So that is very interesting that you said that because obviously I have a brother mm. and we are very close. Yeah. And it's really funny because he has a very similar perspective. Yeah. And it's not that I don't, but I think that it's taken me a really long time to kind of start to really understand that and and get there. However, I really agree with you in terms of like women actually it's never really fed all that narrative around yeah. well, you also got to do your part in the relationship yeah. and you need to show and and care for that human too so i'll come back to that in a second but from a female perspective with a hell of a lot of fire and independence in her i was always like yeah i'm gonna match it right or that i'm that independent that like not i don't need anybody because i don't think those words have ever come out of my yeah. mouth but it was always for me to prove but i don't necessarily think it was because i was female it's just who I am like as a yeah. human right it wasn't necessarily gender for me came into it but growing up there'd be differences between me and my brother right yeah. and even to some no to a lot of degree I don't know why I undermine that to how my dad treated us right oh 100% yeah. especially add culture back into it and I used to be like I'm the oldest like I literally do what and you're gonna give him more leeway and it was like the unfairness and so that definitely put me into a space where I used to drive more to kind of prove right and so for ages, that narrative used to really bug me mm. because I was like, but I can work just as hard. And like, it, just take it to a basic thing in terms of like being out late at night when you're growing up and you're teenagers. Yeah. And why is it, my brother had the same curfew as me and mine wasn't even late, like little things like yeah. that. And he was like, yeah, but if something happens to you, you're less likely to be able to like stop it. And I was like, and I was a tomboy growing up, right? Mm. So I was like, I can, da, da, da. And it was that narrative. But I think you're so right then in terms of like where we're at with like relationships now yeah. and understanding the beauty of that. Yeah, as a female, I am really different. And that honoring in it and honing it and that I can still be a boss and independent and amazing at what I do. But they're two different things. Yeah. And then I think it was actually like so incredibly beautiful when you talked about like does a female know how to like nurture her partner mm. and i know we're talking very much like male female uh relationships yeah. right now but um and i think that's important because even when you said like if a guy is expressing his emotions or is in a space where he can't and doesn't know how to open yeah. up well how are you holding space for that yeah but then it goes back to the narrative depending loads of different narratives of, of how we've grown up but we should be strong. Like you shouldn't show weakness. Don't be vulnerable. Mm. Um, don't show emotion. And then sometimes I feel as a female, not for me because I coach and this is, I'm all about like, come, let's talk, sit down. Yeah, We're going to yeah. have the conversation. We're not avoiding yeah, yeah. it. Probably too much, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure my partner will be like, yep, yeah, sometimes we don't need to talk about everything. Um, but it is that um, narrative, yeah, of like, can you hold space for it? Yeah. And do you know what to do with it? Because there's two of you, in that relationship yeah. and it's hard work it is but th th again like, what you just said that even it's hard work it's supposed to be hard work i say that as it's supposed to be hard work because it, it's it's but it's if it was easy you would be bored and you wouldn't you wouldn't be it has so when i say it has to be hard work it doesn't have to be literally every day agony of like trying to make a relationship work and all this there's it's, a difference there's a difference yeah. and it's about Again, just simply understanding and opening, like you just said, opening that space for your partner in the right way when it is hard. And I go back looking at my parents, like, trust me, they've had their problems. I've been there when, you know, I, I've seen my parents on the verge of splitting up or divorcing and whatever it was. And, but then seeing them fight for each other and be together and how they are so happy now together. Um, it makes me understand that in a relationship regardless of what's going on you must always fight always fight for love because I think it's we are on this world on this planet for for that we love and it doesn't necessarily mean in a partner it means in friendships it means people that you meet like 
that's something that I've learned over the last year, uh, <laughs> close to maybe a few months, uh, is to get rid of this ego, this pride, and stop being so selfish and um, wanting to love someone and, and accepting love as well. As a man, it's very different and sometimes very difficult to accept it as well. But I'm starting to learn. And also on my podcast, I'm talking about it for men. Like I got a message about my recent podcast about how I was filling a void before last year um, with endless interactions with women um, for no purpose. And this man, this guy, his kid actually, sorry, he's a teenager, he messaged me, he's like, yeah, I'm doing the same thing and I don't know how to do it, can I get any advice? I've always noticed him, we spoke all night and he was like, bro, how much do I owe you for the therapy session? I was like, no, you don't owe me anything, it's nothing like that, it's the fact that the fact that I spoke out to you in what I was going through and you now don't feel alone is unbelievable and I'm still in contact with him, I said to him, if you don't even need to chat, just call me, whatever um, and that's really, I found a slight importance of what I'm doing at the moment and a shift in my mindset, a shift in how I treat people, how I love people. Um, I've grown up essentially, which I'm immensely proud of. Whereas I don't think I ever was proud of myself, even though I pretended I was. Mm. And that was, that's a big thing at the moment for me. It's like, oh shit, I am proud of myself. I'm proud of like who I am now and who I've become. We're here for the grown-up version mm, of Miles, yeah. okay? Serious Miles has come on board. Mm, I'm I'm ready <laughs> for it, okay? Um, so just um, before we kind of get to the end and yes. we wrap up. Yeah. What do you think is one of the things that shifted for you in terms of how you show up when it comes to like love and relationships? And I mean like romantic, not friendships. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> I feel like, I feel, I'm just going to say this first. Yeah. I didn't even let you answer the question, okay? <laughs> I feel like you're going through something. Yeah. And I, I am a really big, I've had this conversation with one of my clients actually. And it's because they have quite a big social media presence. And they feel pressure to like share. And they're like, yeah, but Mira, I'm not being authentic. And I was like, mm, yeah. okay, let's just shift perspective on it. So I'm going to share my belief, which sometimes I don't as a coach because I stay so neutral. Yeah. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of why you're going through something, trying to share it, because mm. I think there's so much power in being able to go through it and experience yeah. it. And then when you're ready. So I don't want you to feel like you have to give loads away, but just reflecting. So I feel like you are in quite a reflective state at the moment. Um, yeah. What What is something that you're doing differently in terms of how you show up? Uh, allow myself to be vulnerable. Um, for the last six years I've not shown a version of myself who is the person that I am to anyone and recently I did <laughs> and as scary as it was and how probably the most painful it's been in the last couple of weeks it's the most essential thing that I've had to go through in my life I had to feel that I had to, and it goes back to what I was saying to you before about embracing those feelings. I became a man that I didn't think I ever would be. And I used to laugh at those guys. You know, I genuinely did like, I was just like, honestly, this word, which is horrendous, like man up, like fucking mm. hell. She did this has happened, whatever, walk away, walk forward, get your, your head and work, do this and all that. And there's a side of it that I still do agree. Cause I think that you are your, most powerful version of yourself you need to control that and you need to do things for yourself and no one else is going to do it so you need to pick yourself up but then there's a new side which i've discovered which is fuck me man i i've never cried so much in my life in the last three weeks two weeks and as much as i don't really like to admit that it was so like i needed to go through it I needed this, this, what's happened to me recently had to happen um, because it's taught me so many amazing, valuable lessons about myself and how I give love, like I was saying before, and how I receive love. And what, I mean, I guess going back to your question of like, how do I show up? I've realized that I'm no longer giving my energy or my person and my body to someone that I don't care about. And that is something that I used to neglect. And also as a guy, again, who cares, whatever. 
now I'm like, no, no way. And because I was in a vulnerable stage with someone and they opened up my heart and they managed to let me be me, which no one sees. And Mm -hmm. that for me was incredible. Like, oh my God, like I'm so grateful for that. Mm. And I actually thanked the person, even though it's not what, how it is supposed to be. I wanted it to be now. Um, And this is, I said this before on my, the last podcast I did. And I said, fight for what you believe and don't be ashamed of being vulnerable and feeling stupid and feeling like you're too much or whatever. Like there is, I guess that it, obviously there's a limitation to it as well, where you need to stop when, if someone or something is not right, you need to learn to take a step back. But if you believe that there is the right person out there for you and you've met someone who is your person, fucking go for it. And I did, and I don't regret a thing. So I'm so proud of you. (laughs) (laughs) I barely want to add anything on that because I just feel like what a beautiful note to end. I am going to say one thing because I can't help myself, all right? I just can't. Um, Listen to you as well as talk about what you believed and like this new version of you. Mm. I'm biased. I'm like, yes, let's shift you into the new version, okay? But in terms of... I really understand your narrative when you say, you know, like no one's going to do it for you. You need to do it for yourself. And with everything, everything needs context. But I'm just going to say for everybody listening as well, just be aware of like, if that is your narrative and it's your only narrative because it creates the feeling as well, which I'm guessing this is where it showed up for you in relationships Mm -hmm. of like, all right, I'm not going to open up. Like I'm not going to be vulnerable because if anything happens and underneath that is fear, Mm. right? As humans, right? Cool. None of us want to get rejected. Like none of Of us, it's a human thing, right? But then there's all the other fears through our lives and our lens and our experiences. And knowing that is then that narrative of like, yeah, cool. No one's still going to, you can still be in a relationship, but you can still be healthy and you can still have that underneath fear of like, I still got to just protect myself just in case. Yeah. And actually, like, you're holding yourself back. So I just thought I'd slide that in there. That's no, true. Very gently. I agree. I want to say the biggest thank you. You have been a pleasure. Aww. I really hope that people get to see a side of you that perhaps, you know, they haven't seen before. Yeah. So I always ask every guest three questions to wrap up. I'm putting you on the spot. Go for it. They're very coachy questions. So oh. I'm going to say, but they're not about you. It's to help okay. everybody listening. And it can be anything that you've said in the episode already. Okay, cool. I feel like you're going to repeat this one and this was just beautiful. A uh, quote that you want to share? Uh, this too shall pass. Oh, love it. Um, and then a practical tip that you want to leave our, our listeners with. Um, something that I need to live by more because I've recently not done it as much. But when you wake up and you have that feeling of like, I don't want to get up or I don't want to get out of bed or you're feeling a little bit sad or you're feeling anxious, whatever it is, uh, lie on your back uh count to three and clear your mind and you'll you'll just get up so just go one two three and then you'll just literally lift up and then get out of bed and then get the day going love it and then last question um a book a podcast you can plug yours or resource that you want to leave our listeners with so you want to go and listen to playtime podcast um if you want to go and uh, check it out, listen to it. It's a great podcast. Uh, no, you know what? Uh, I would probably say um, oh, a podcast to listen to that I really like. Actually, yeah, I'll leave you with this one. If you go either to, and he's done loads now, but Matthew Walker, listen to anything about sleep and how important it is to sleep. Um, it honestly opens your eyes about life. So yeah, Matthew Walker. You are amazing. The biggest, biggest thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been amazing. Great. (laughs) Vulnerable Miles. (laughs) 